if a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good for the second half. And wow, what a second half it's going to be. Today we have Jessica Lumberg from Lumberg Family Farms. And Jessica, your family is legendary when it comes to sustainability and green. And way before it was ever cool or hip or really the green revolution had taken hold in America. And thank you so much. It's humbling to have you on the show today with Mike Brady and myself. Thank you for coming on Green is Good. Well, thank you for having me. So tell us, you know, your family's history a little bit. When when did Lundberg Family Farm start, and when did they go green, and, and why did they go green back then? Well, uh, we've got a pretty long history in farming. Uh, my dad's family were corn and cattle farmers in Nebraska, and they moved to the United States in the 1800s. But really, my grandfather, uh, the reason that we came here was after the Dust Bowl in the early 1930s, uh, farming was really difficult for people, and life was really hard. And he had stayed and was working the homestead, and he really wanted to make a go of it. But he had the opportunity to come out to California and make a fresh start. And he saw that as a tremendous opportunity for his family. So they moved out to California in 1937. Wow. And he came with my uh, my grandma and then my dad and my uncles. But he also came with the knowledge of what happens when you don't take care of the land. And so he had seen what happened in the Dust Bowl when you over-farm and you over-ranch and you aren't considering the health of your soil. So when he came to California, he was told by the land barons at the time, the land brokers that were selling ground, that this is the land of milk and honey and you can grow anything you want. <laughs> well, that's true. California is absolutely beautiful and we have one of the most diverse agricultural systems in the world. But where he settled is Richvale, California, which is northern California. We have very heavy, heavy clay soils which are perfect for growing rice because we don't have a lot of drainage. We have a hard pan layer about three to five feet down, which keeps the water from draining, and we have a beautiful water source coming off of the Feather River. So he started farming here in 1937 and with this idea that the soil should be cared for. The soil is an organism in itself, and we've got to take care of the soil. In fact, he came with this idea that you need to leave the land better than you found it, and how do we keep improving the system? So he came almost as one of the first environmentalists. Like you said, before it was really cool, it wasn't a matter of being cool to him. It was a matter of being able to farm healthy foods in a healthy way that supported his family. So he was a sustainable farmy, farmer back from right from the beginning of your family business here in California. California. Yep, that's exactly right. So, so, so now he picked Richfield. You, he opened up the family business, and so t take us from there. I mean, I know there's a process that's part of it called the cage roller. What is a cage roller, and 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 what did, what was your grandfather's involvement with that? Well, okay, so we're farming in the 30s, late 30s. My dad and uncles are young boys, and they're growing up with their dad <laughs> farming. Then they had several opportunities that happened. We had the Green Revolution that came out on in the 40s and the 50s. But then my dad and uncles were, were grown men farming with their dad, and they had an opportunity because they had some customers, some people that moved here from New York City and asked them, would you grow rice for us? And these were people who, like you mentioned, were at the very beginnings of the macrobiotic foods movement. So at the time, my dad and uncles were... Uh, they were members of the local co-op, and for them to be able to farm rice and keep it in their own storage bins and then mill it themselves, they would have to pull out of the local co-op. So they built the smallest rice mill in California and started their own business. So my grandfather was very influential in helping them develop these philosophies, but then he was also a real encourager of, of them to be inventive, you know, know your soil, know your rice, know your plants, and think of ways that you can do it better. So he was a tremendous encourager. So when it came to how do we handle our straw, how do we make our soil better, mm. well, most of our rice farming neighbors around us were burning the straw. Oh. They saw it as it was cheap, it was easy, it was something that they considered the straw was a waste product and they just need to get it off the field. But keep in mind, if you're thinking the straw is actually a nutrient that adds to the organic matter, it, it's not a waste product. It doesn't become an issue of how do we get rid of it. It becomes an issue of how do we use it. Oh. That's where the straw cage roller came into effect. That My dad and uncles, they met with, uh, they all sat down. They brought in a couple guys that were helping them on the farm, and they said, all right, we're going to use this straw. We're not going to burn it. How do we do this? Oh, you should have seen the stuff that they tried. Some of these inventions they had, these huge big rubber wheels that they had made. They had things with big cleats on it. They had this one tractor that they had big wheels. 
that they thought would work, but it actually was floating like a boat across the field, pushing a big wall of water. So through trial and error, they discovered, okay, this is the best way to do it. We're going to develop a big roller made out of rebar iron that we pull behind the field, allowing the water that's in this flooded field to flow through it, but it's heavy enough that it mashes the straw into the soil, and it really allows you for on-site composting. So they just sat down. They started thinking, what's the issue? What do we want to do with it? The health of the soil is a priority, and how do we get there? So it's real, really ingenious. Wow. And so wait a second. You're, you, so this is your grandpa, and how many sons did he have? Uh, my grandparents had four boys. And it was all four boys that went into business together in the, in 1969 is when they built the smallest rice mill in California. That's when our business started, Lundberg Family Farms. And that's when they came up with the cage roller? They came up with the cage roller in, uh, I believe in the mid-60s. So okay. They, wow. They've been working, it was 1963 that my grandpa and my dad and uncles all agreed we're not going to burn any more rice stubble on this ranch because my grandfather, like I mentioned, he came with he came as almost one of the first environmentalists, and he said, okay, for one, this isn't environmentally sustainable, but he says this isn't good for our neighbors, and our farms have to think of ourselves as the neighbors to our cities, and it's not good for our employees. So he saw this more as a holistic process, not just I, I'm one cog. He saw himself as I'm part of a greater community, and this isn't good for any of us. Well, the biggest thing, too, Jesse, because I, I think uh, people that are familiar with the story of Tom Joad and the Grapes of Wrath and uh, know about the uh, the Dust Bowl, a lot of people don't realize that that was a – it didn't just happen to people from Texas and the Panhandle and, and Oklahoma and the Plain States, but that really affected – that was like a double blow – uh, the country was in the middle of an economic depression. And when Congress really started to understand what was going on, there were members of Congress that were getting dust off of their desks in Washington, realizing that that had originated and had, had been blown mid-continent, had started way out west. That's exactly right. Wow. You know, it's, it's interesting because something similar years and years later happened in California that was uh, interesting because with my dad and uncles as kind of the innovators of how do we use this straw, but they saw it more of we want the straw as a tool because it adds to our organic matter, it makes our soils healthier. Well, jump then later about 30 years to around the year 2000 in California, and there was, um, it's, it's folklore in a way, but it actually happened that in the state capital, uh, there was smoke from the rice fields that blew into Sacramento and set off the fire alarms in the state capitol building. Wow. And they said, okay, this isn't good. And it was <laughs> then that it was legislated that rice, that all rice farmers in California would have to conform to no burning or at least limited percentage burning. And that's when people stepped back and said, okay, now what, we, what do we do with this? And they started looking at people like my dad and uncles who had been doing this for years and proven that you can do it and use that as a model. So let's go back to 1969. The four brothers, including which was your, your dad, mm -hmm. was your grandpa still alive at this point? Yep, my grandpa was alive. He died, I uh, believe he died in 1971. Wow. So, so he was still alive. He got to see the business start. He got to see them build the mill. He saw them start with their first organic customers. And at the time, organic wasn't even defined. We... Uh, my dad and uncles, they'd farmed with their dad without using chemicals. The Green Revolution had started. They went along with a lot of their neighbors and using synthetic fertilizers. But they also sat back and questioned this and said, you know, we need to be really involved in our farming practices, and we need to be, we need to be making decisions for the health of our farm and not listening to other people and just following along with, with what everyone else is doing. So when we had the opportunity to sell directly to people who wanted rice farming who did it differently they started with about 60 acres trying it going back like their ground like their father did with 60 acres and working up building a business off of uh, the idea that we're going to grow as much of this as people will buy from us and so it started small because they also had the idea that we can't put the farm under this has to be you've heard of the the three three-legged stool of sustainability with environmental social and economic Right. They said, we're gonna, we believe in this. We believe this is a principle that we want to farm on. We want to support our families on this. We're going to make sure it's economically sustainable also. So we're going to grow as much as people will buy from us, and we're going to just keep pushing this market and letting people know what we have to sell. Well, so, so your, your family really, now that I'm understanding this for our listeners' knowledge, really 
were into the whole issue of green DNA before that was even cool in terms of everything they did had to revolve around people, planet, and profits to make sure the business would succeed. And you, they, they, you basically invented what organic farming was. They were there right at the beginning. In fact, uh, if people know the history of the Rodale family and uh, working with organics and macrobiotics and kind of going through the whole defining process of organics, my dad and uncles were right there at the beginning talking about this, having these dialogues of what is this process and how do we define it. Wow. So they didn't even use the word organics, I don't believe, until the late 70s. Up until then, I think they called it ecological farming. So what was so so now define... Uh, why, when you look back, which is always somewhat easier when you look in a rearview mirror, why did your why did your dad and his brothers succeed, uh, and your grandpa obviously succeed, as opposed to some of your competitors? What you know, what has set you know them apart? Why did that resonate, and how did how has that evolved, and and how is that going currently as we sit today? You know, I think a lot of it was um, they believed in trial and error. And they believed they were farmers to begin with. And I think that was really key to them, that they were very genuine people. And they believed in the processes. They believed in organics. They believed in healthy foods. They believed in selling foods to people here in the United States that were going to eat it. But the success, I think a lot of it was, for one, that they were farming as a family, that they could rely on each other and spread the risks, which also meant they spread the benefits. And I think, like you'd mentioned, this this really strong business idea of um, you grow your business based on consumer demands. You can't push it any faster than it's going to grow that you, then you can support with the health of your farm and the economics behind it. But then they also really believed in this idea of connecting the farm with their customers and meeting their customers. I mean, the idea of when we first started up having a truck that they'd fill with rice and drive up and down the coast of California and Washington and Oregon and getting out at little stores and meeting people and shaking their hands and saying, we're farmers, and getting to know what do people want and talking to them about it, and then going that extra step of creating a business to sell products that they made and paying a fair price that supported the way of, that they were growing it. So they didn't also, just because they were creating a special a product that hopefully was even better than the competitors, it was at a fair price. It wasn't more expensive. So everyone could still afford the, the great product that it was. Right. So it was on both ends, though. It had to be affordable for people. It had to be very high quality because they believe that from the beginning, very high quality. You Just because it said organic doesn't mean that people should take a lesser quality product. So from the beginning, it was the best. And then, though, to also pay a good return to the growers, to themselves and to their other growers as they started taking more people on, it has to cover the cost of farming. I think that's part, when you talk about uh, the true cost of food, a lot of times people forget that there are costs that aren't recovered sometimes when you talk about good, healthy food. And so they had this idea that if it costs more to incorporate the straw, to uh, fallow your fields more, to let the fields rest, that they were going to incorporate that and pay a fair cost to the farmers for growing it, which meant themselves and their other growers, but then, like you said, deliver a quality product at a price that people can afford. Well, J J Jessica, in truth in advertising, as I told you before we went on the air, I've been a huge fan of your uh, of your family uh, since 1980 when I was at Boston University, and the, and Misho Kushi was instructing everybody to eat your short brown rice, and I still eat your short brown rice. I think it's the greatest rice out there. But tell us where the, your company is today. Now that the green revolution has taken hold and sustainability is cool and hip, where tell us um, a little bit about the family. Where you know uh, in terms of what what your role is, are any of the, uh, the original, uh, your dad and the original uh, founding brothers still alive, and, and, and how big is the company in terms of, without giving away any secrets in terms of finances, in terms of employees and market size and everything else? Give, give our listeners a little taste of that. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm happy to share uh, because it's really exciting, yeah, the things that I've seen happen over the last few years. Well, like I said, the business started in 69, and we were basically just short grain brown rice. And in, through the 1980s, we got into rice cakes and several other varieties of rice. And then we started doing things like boxed items, like puddings and hot cereals and risottos, and then into some snack foods like chips. Uh, we have rice syrup, rice pasta. Uh, and so now, just in a nutshell, we have over 150 different products. We grow 17 different varieties of rice. Wow. We have 
just categories of products that are gluten-free, that are whole grain. We also do white rice. That was a tremendous debate. (laughs) In the 1980s, we were brown rice. In fact, the name of our company was Lundberg Brown Rice, not Lundberg Family Farms. That's right. That was a debate, but we decided... (laughs) As a as a family, we decided, you know, rice is a good, nutritious food, and there are varieties of rice around the world that people enjoy as a white rice, and people need to have a balanced diet, but that can be done with right, white rice. But i got to tell you, we're still biased to the brown rice. I still eat all brown rice. So that was a tremendous debate. Oh, you should have been in that room. But, uh, but we do have brown rice and white rice and the 17 varieties and over 150 different products. And then our family has yeah. grown. All four of the brothers and my aunts and my mother are still alive. Wonderful. Uh, but it's 40 a, years later. Well, that, that, that itself that's, is a testimony. That's to the, great advertising. That's great advertising for, your, for, the, for the health of your products and the... And the, and the that's great. So, but uh, all all four of the brothers have stepped off the board because they wanted their children. They wanted the company to continue. They saw that right. succession is one of the things about sustainability. If you want it to keep going, you've got to allow people to step up, which has been a tremendous, gracious gift. They wow. So what? now we have it's still a family owned company, and we have an eight member board of directors. It's all family, and there's eleven of us cousins. And out of the eleven cousins, seven of us work here every day. Wow. So, and then um, beyond just the family, we have 185 employees that work throughout our operations. And we are an integrated company, so we still have our family farm. We still farm rice. I manage our seed nursery, so I handle our specialty varieties with uh, seed selection and some plant breeding and looking for new varieties and keeping the purity of the varieties that we have. But uh, we do everything from our seed to the farming to our drying and storage, the milling. Some of our products are, are actually manufactured here on site. We do all of our shipping off-site. We have a sales force, and we do our own marketing and communications. And now where we started just being West Coast and selling mainly in California in the early 70s, now we sell 90% of our products are sold in the United States, but all over the United States. So there's very few places that you can't go if they have a natural food section that you wouldn't find some of our products. Well, you know, it's really cool, too, while, while we're talking here. I took the liberty of going on to your site and just looking at the different products where you're talking about the plethora of products that you've got. Uh, some of the recipes in there are just making my mouth water. But uh, also, organic doesn't have to mean, oh, you have to spend forever. Anybody that's ever made risotto from scratch knows that that's, that's kind of a labor of love. But looking here, you have got, you've got a variety of heat and eat foods right here. Oh, there's some pretty, you know, that's one of those things that we've tried to do as a company is we want to have whole grain healthy products. But we also didn't want people to be intimidated by rice because rice is a staple around the world, and it's something that we as American consumers actually don't know very much about. And for us being farmers and having this connection to this amazing world of these different flavors and textures and aromas that you can get just from something as simple as rice, we wanted people to not be intimidated. So we started creating some of these uh, easy to use products, like you say, box items like a risotto in a box. Mm-hmm. That all you do is you you pour the rice out of one pouch, you pour the spice out of another pouch, you put a little bit of oil if you want it, you add water and you stir. So the reason for that is not not to make it less elegant, but more to okay, this is a primer. This is how we get you used to it. See if you like it, and if you like it, you'll graduate to buy the arborio and do something fabulous on your own. Well, there are so many great recipes as well as a list of products. And really, a shout-out to uh, to your website, which is just so easy to navigate and has so much great information. Uh, if you'd like to check it out, it's uh, www, of course, Lundberg, L-U-N-D as in David, B as in Baker, E-R-G, Lundberg.com. And uh, boy, oh boy, I'll tell you, <laughs> this is really, I'm going to let John talk because I'm hungry. <laughs> Uh, listen, I'm, I, I love your brown. I can live on your brown rice. I have, in fact, as a college student and beyond, whenever I've uh, wanted to get back into the health mode, your brown rice is always, to me, the number one staple that I uh, that I always go to. So you've got fans right here in studio, Jessica. So you're good. Yeah, you're. Um, but tell us, you know, tell us a couple. You know, in terms of green D, green DNA, we're down to the last couple of minutes, okay. and your and your family is just unbelievably inspirational, and you are inspirational. Rachel, t- tell us, give, give, with, with the last couple of minutes that we have, talk about a couple of the uh, other type of projects you work on in terms of GMO, in terms of your, your, your solar panels sure. and, and stuff like that. 
All right. Let me see if I can just tell you a few. Um, sure. One of them, back to the fields, just in sure. Uh, because we use cover crops, we also will sometimes have waterfowl that will come into our fields, and we have uh, created some relationships with some people locally that have um, volunteers that will come in and gather those duck eggs, and we take them to licensed hatcheries, hatch out the birds and release them. And over 20 years, we've probably done uh, released about 20,000 birds back to the wildlife. So that's our program called our, our Egg Aid. Wow. So that's one thing. But then another thing, you mentioned solar panels. Yeah. Around 2000, we as a company, especially my cousins and I, we saw that, yes, we are farmers. We believed we were doing well by the soil. But we said, you know, but now we're also a company. We're a rice company making products. Where's our next big use of resources? And we said, that's electrical energy. We need to be responsible for that. So we started looking for how do we tangibly give back? How do we do something to be responsible with our electrical energy use? So, of course, we jumped in and looked at conservation of how much we're using. But then we said, how can we manufacture electricity? There were great programs in place. We jumped in and put in two different solar panel projects, one on the ground over by our dryers, another on the roof of our warehouse. Um, that's not nearly enough. We're, we're uh, generating about 12% of our energy on site. So we said, okay, now what can we do until we're able to bridge that gap? So we went out and purchased RECs, or renewable energy credits. Those credits uh, will go back. They, a portion of that covers our electrical use, saying that we're purchasing the equivalent in credits, and some of that money goes then towards supporting other projects that are being used throughout the state to develop renewable energy. So we felt that was one way that we could step in and help support renewable energy, even though we couldn't generate all of it here on site. But we're also looking at potentially uh, covering the rest of our warehouse and putting wow. solar panels on top of a new office that we're looking at building in the next year or so. And then you mentioned the non-GMO project. Yeah. Um, we feel we're still farmers. We're still connected to the land, and we for <laughs> sure believe in the health of our products and in the consumer's right to uh, know what's in their food and to choose healthy food. So we got involved in the non-GMO project, and we're one of the founding members, and we sit on their board of directors. Uh, the non-GMO project that we're specifically involved with, it's a nonprofit organization that was created by leaders like us representing all sectors of organic and natural products uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada, and we wanted to be able to offer consumers a consistent non-GMO choice for organic and natural products that are produced without genetic engineering or uh, recombinant DNA technologies. And that's because our company believes that there are, there are parts of genetic, genetically modified um, crops of food and fiber that just haven't been proven uh, with their benefits either to farmers or to our health or to agriculture or to the environment. So that's just something that we don't support as a company, and we feel that people need a choice. So we've stepped up as part of the non-GMO project to support their efforts to label projects uh, or to label products through companies and retailers who want to support products like that. Jessica, before we sign off today, tell us, if you were stuck on an island for six <laughs> months alone, what out of your 150 or so wonderful Lundberg family farm <laughs> products, what one product would you take with you to sustain yourself? You know, it's a funny thing. I think short grain brown. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Well, well, Jessica Lundberg, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Mike and I are so thankful. We're humbled. Lundberg Family Farms. All our listeners should go to Lundberg.com. And we got to just tell you something. The people out there are thankful for your family. The planet is thankful for your, for your family. And Jessica Lundberg, you are living proof that green is good.